Hello everybody, my name is Dr. Heather Williams. I'm, I'm a researcher and lecturer at the State University of New York at Buffalo. Um, this talk is about our work trying to use a new approach to try to address and update our knowledge on a really old question. Um, I'll be talking about artificial intelligence and purple martin breeding ecology. Um, so by breeding ecology, we're largely talking about the events that occur inside the nest. Um, so in this talk, I'll be talking about incubation, so sitting on those eggs, and provisioning, bringing food to nestlings. Um, we already know that those two things are really important. They've got a lot of consequences. They determine hatching success. They can change the, the bacterial environment in the nest. They can affect offspring quality and body condition, as well as predation risk. Um, they can determine how many of those eggs um, actually hatch and how many of those hatchlings actually go on to fledge. Um, so these early life events for nestlings have got carryover effects which might be observed through the rest of that individual's life. But despite their importance, it's kind of difficult to observe a lot of these um, breeding ecology type events. And when we're working with cavity nesters like purple martins, it's naturally cryptic. They're hidden away inside that cavity. Often by trying to observe these activities, we're actually worried that we're disturbing the very activities we want to record. Um, so we're worried about that for the impact on the birds, but also for the validity of our data. So often we either have to use proxy measurements, um, something which might correlate with what we really care about. So something like measuring egg temperature to give us an idea of incubation behavior. Or we're reliant on old school methods, guy with binoculars, watching a nest for a really long time. Um, that can be pretty laborious and it often means that our conclusions are based on a very small number of nests and a very small number of individuals, which is not ideal. So nest cameras have become commonplace and are really an ideal tool for this sort of question. Um, they can be put in ahead of time, they can record without disturbing the birds and we can record as much data as we want. Um, so I initially started doing this as part of my work with Purple Martins. Um, we installed nest cameras in 12 gourds at my field site um, here in Western New York at Iroquois National Wildlife Refuge. Um, we use data from these for uh, two breeding seasons with the cameras running from kind of that nest initiation stage until the birds fledge the nest. This worked great in a lot of ways. Here's an example of some of the footage right here. You can see four eggs, and you can see one of the adults just in the doorway. Um, so with this relatively small sample size, we accumulated rather a lot of video. So just looking at eight nests in this initial case for the 18 days that the birds incubate, with the cameras running 15 hours per day, accumulates more than 2,000 hours of video to be watched. Similarly, for that provisioning stage, looking at 20 nests, for the duration that the nestlings are in there, that's more than 8,000 hours of video. Now, I think we'll all agree these videos are fun to see, but maybe not 2,000 or 10,000 hours worth of footage that you really want to watch. So to be able to scale up our analysis of these videos, we started using artificial intelligence, or more specifically, using deep learning neural networks. Um, so whether you're a tech person or not, you're likely familiar with it. Um, many of us have it in our phones happening all the time. So when I take pictures of my kids, which I do all the time, this is my boy Callum, it all gets saved into Google Photos, which then helpfully, or not, depending on your opinion, runs through all my pictures without me asking it to or telling it what to look for. It knows which of my kids is which, it knows all the people in the pictures, and, and it looks for similar patterns. So it's able to present me with a whole collage of pictures of my kid eating cookies at various events. So it's automatically sorting through those images for me without a human impact. So we use this same idea to watch the purple martin uh, videos. 
So to kind of get a concept of how this works, obviously when we see an image, it might look something like this, but when computers look at the same image, they're not looking at these puppies. They're looking at a series of pixels or boxes, each of which are associated with a numeric value. So the goal in this convolutional neural network is to train an algorithm with a set of rules to be able to process and label images correctly so it can recognize the things that we care about. Um, one of the features of this is that it doesn't rely on manually defined features. So I don't physically go into this program and say, this is a purple martin, this is an egg. The computer has to kind of figure it out by itself based on how well it scores on a set of training images. So it goes through these and looks kind of the different layers of complexity in the image. But a very simple visualization here is you might have one of these that are designed to look for a curve in an image. So perhaps to a computer with the pixels and the numbers, it has kind of a, a, an, a line here of, of 30s in the pixels that looks something like this. So it's looking for certain features. So we trained a model, first of all, to help us define incubation attentiveness. So just the proportion of time that the adults are in the nest incubating those eggs during the egg phase. So we trained our model with more than 12,000 images. Um, we wanted it to tell us whether a bird is incubating, like in A, not incubating, like in B, um, but we also wanted it to have some of the subtlety. So in C, you can see, you can actually see these eggs. The adult bird is in the nest, but they're not sitting on them. They're not actually incubating. So for the model to be able to recognize as we would that this is not a case of incubation. So our computer model did pretty well. It got more than 99% of accuracy on the validation images. So it's able to do this job just as well as a human could and doesn't get as bored. <laughs> so overall, when we looked at that, we found that our purple martin adults were attentive during incubation. So they were sitting on those eggs for about 72% of the time. Um, in reality, this is probably slightly higher because our cameras don't record at night when there's likely an adult in contact with the nest at all times. Um, we found there was quite a bit of variation nest by nest with the, the least attentive parents at about 68% and the most close to 80%. Um, but those durations of staying on the nest are relatively modest. So a mean on bout would be a, an adult sitting on those eggs for about 15, 20 minutes. And a mean off bout, they wouldn't leave them unattended for more than seven minutes. These results largely agreed um, with what is known about Martins in the literature from those old studies using binoculars. No big surprises. Um, we were also interested in kind of environmental and biological variation and how that affected how attentive the adults were. Um, so we ran a random forest mo model and included some of these factors right here as potential things that might explain variation in incubation attentiveness. We found by far um, the biggest predictor of attentiveness was ambient temperature. So the warmer it is outside, the less time they're spending in contact with those eggs. We looked at that a little more closely um, and we found kind of the evidence that there's an overall decline in attentiveness with temperature, as you might expect, but that beyond around 24 degrees in our data, there's a sudden much sharper decline in that relationship. So this is especially interesting because the physiological zero temperature for eggs is right around this point. So that physiological zero temperature is the temperature beyond which eggs will continue to develop normally without additional heating needed. So this is kind of cool, in my opinion, because not only are these birds responding to an environmental signal, but they're able to do that in this relatively complicated way where they're detecting somehow, whether that's environmentally or from a signal from the egg, when they're already at that critical temperature and when the adult can kind of leave the nest and attend to other matters without it impacting the eggs negatively.
Okay. So we use the same approach to look at the next stage of breeding ecology, to look at provisioning. So when the adults are bringing food to their offspring. Um, this model worked basically as an adult bird counter. Um, so we trained the model to know when there was one bird in the nest, when there were no birds in the nest, or when there were two birds in the nest. So we were able to estimate that provisioning occurred each time the number of adults in the nest increased. Um, some of these images were easily classified. Some of them were hard for the model. A bird with one outstretched wing kind of looks like two birds. Or two birds huddled up together on a cold, wet day could easily be confused with one bird. Um, so this model eventually also did pretty well. I think we have some video example here. Um, accuracy was great for these young, youngest nestlings between hatch day and day five, and decreased a little as we went through that nesting process. Um, we had to stop our analysis around halfway through the nesting period with 13 day old nestlings, largely because they tended to all crowd around the entrance and it was hard to see definitively, even as a human, whether or not an adult was really coming into that nest. So we recorded data like this for 20 nests over two years and found an impressive um, mean number of provisioning visits of 186 visits per day in our recording hours. But there was pretty huge variation in that with some nests only getting 43 visits in a day, while others got very close to 300. So a lot of variation to explain. So we looked at this variation again with a random forest model. The largest part of that variation was described by nestling age. They visit more as nestlings get bigger. Um, this, to me, interestingly kind of mirrors the nestling growth curve. So they're kind of responding to that change or increase in the physiological need of their larger nestlings over time. We also saw quite a big impact of um, ambient weather conditions. So days that it rains, where the higher rainfall, provisioning is greatly decreased, similarly when it's pretty cold outside. That's probably not surprising to any of us familiar with this species. As an aerial insectivore, it's simply not able to hunt effectively during cold or wet conditions. So we kind of use these sorts of analyses to help us firm up our understanding of some big ecological and evolutionary questions about breeding ecology. We expect parental care to be advantageous. Of course, parents do well by looking after their offspring, but we also expect there to be limits to that. Um, so when do you stop feeding a nestling or how much incubation is enough? So in this study, we found evidence of environmental limitations to parental care. So think about that incubation behavior and how much it was affected by temperature or the provisioning and how provisioning necessarily is limited in wet or cool conditions. Um, but we also found evidence that the birds are responding to physiological changes in requirements or physiological limitations with that provisioning study where those larger nestlings are getting provisioned more. So overall, this supports our assumption that while parents are, of course, selected to look after their offspring, there are evolutionary limits that are imposed on that care. So to summarise this work, um, we found that incubation behaviour was largely caused by environmental conditions, mostly temperature, um, but that provisioning variation was largely caused by changing physiological needs in the nestling. Um, the big contribution of this work was that we were able to use a continuous form of data analysis with the camera footage and analysis to help us understand these dynamics on a much larger data set than we would normally be able to use, thanks to our use of artificial intelligence to watch a lot of this data for us. Okay, um, with that, I would like to thank my co-authors on this work, um, Bob DeLeon and Sean, Mat Sean Mattet, and you can read more about this work in any of these publications. 
Um, I'd also like to thank the staff and volunteers at Iroquois National Wildlife Refuge for their support and the Purple Martin Conservation Association for partially funding this work and for inviting me to give this talk. And I'd like to thank you all very much for listening. Hope to see you all soon.